clear body again tonight with us as we continue our study of the book of John. Now, last week we were closing out in chapter 13, and I want us to review that chapter before we move on into what we have in chapter 14. But again, I want to reiterate that John is writing an apocalyptic, not apocalyptic, but apologetic book. That is, he's writing to prove that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the only begotten Son of God. Now, in reality, it takes Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John to get the complete picture of the life of Christ in the flesh on this earth. But John writes differently from Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are known as synoptic accounts of the gospel because they basically start and cover the beginning and life of Christ. If you take these courses in a college course, many times they'll be described as the life of Christ. But when you come to John, he doesn't take it up in biographical form. He simply begins to call various witnesses and give various evidences that prove, when properly reasoned with, that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is who he claimed to be. Of course, Jesus himself, as we've already studied in John 14, made it clear in verse 6 that I am the way, the truth of the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And that's the point of the whole thing. In fact, if you would really think about the whole of the Bible, then it's pointing us to Christ. There is not a multiplicity of ways. There's not a multiplicity of truth. There's not a multiplicity of uh, lives. There's one Lord. There's one way. There's only one life. There's only one truth. And that's why we find in John 8, 31, 31 and 32, that Jesus said, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And when he records Christ praying on the night before his crucifixion, in John 17, 17, he said, Father, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. We see the word called the seed of the kingdom, Luke 8, 11. It's called the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, Ephesians 6, 17. And of course, Paul said, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap of themselves teachers, having itching ears, and shall be turned away from the truth unto fables. So we need to know the power of the word. And the power of the word is that which conveys the will of Christ. Words are vehicles of thought. We get in our automobiles. We travel from one point to the other. If we want what's on our mind to be in the other person's mind, then we use words that convey the same ideas from us to them and vice versa. So words are vehicles of thought. They are signs of ideas. We have the thoughts of God, thus the will of God in the word of God. Therefore, we don't deviate from it to the right hand or to the left. Now, throughout uh, chapter 13, uh, Jesus made it clear in the beginning that he is the teacher. That is, he is the master teacher. He is not only the teacher, he is the Lord. And he claimed that the betrayal, his, his betrayal by Judas Iscariot was foretold in the scriptures. It was not happenstance, but Judas would do what he did. And he claims that those who receive him receive the Father. He specifically identifies the one who would betray him, as we studied last week. As we've said already, that would be Judas Iscariot. And he then, of course, calls himself the Son of Man. Son of Man identifies himself with mankind. Well, remember, we learn in John 1, verses 1 and 2, and verse 14, that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, John writes. We beheld his glory, glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Christ claimed that God would glorify the Son immediately. That meant as he had in mind and was discussing at that point in chapter 13, his death on the cross. That would bring glory to God 
because it was all figured in the way that God would offer salvation to man. There is no other way. And he states plainly that he was going away. That is, when he would die, be buried, raised the third day, and then he would ascend back to the Father. And he also said that you can't come, meaning right now, speaking to the apostles where I'm going. But yet he told them they would later on come and be with him. So he foretold the fact that Simon Peter also would even deny him and deny him three times. Though Peter was really boasting that though they all forsook him, he would not. And that's a good place for us to end the various, uh, the very uh, summation of chapter 13, because it's all too often an easy thing to sit in an easy chair and boast what great things we would do when times are hard. And Peter was able to do that, but he learned right quick that he wasn't as strong in faith and in zeal to do the truth as he thought he was. Thus, he learned a great lesson that we ought to learn ourselves. Now, this summarizes chapter 13, which we studied a little more in detail last week. But remember, our way of doing this is for you to read the chapter and think about the words, and we'll follow through with the idea of emphasizing the facts without reading every word of the chapter as we go back through it. First of all, in chapter 14, and Jesus is speaking to his apostles. I want to remind you that this is a private, intimate, pri uh, personal conversation that uh, the apostle John records between Jesus and his apostles. And much of what is said here is said to the apostles pertinent to their work to which the Lord had called them. He tells them plainly, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God believe also in me. Notice the responsibility that each one of us has, as they did, to not allow ourselves to be troubled over those things that God doesn't want us to be troubled over. Sometimes we think that God will just lift that trouble off of us. No, no, we don't have any part in it. We just say, Father, take it away and it's gone. But you'll notice that word let. In the Greek, it has the same force as a command. I'm commanding you not to let your heart be troubled. So I have a responsibility to do what's necessary to not be troubled by the things that should not trouble faithful children of God. Now, the Lord has taught all along about the fact that people could take your life physically. But he pointed out you should fear God who, after he's killed, can cast both body and soul into hell. Our greatest concern should be the spiritual. Everybody has to die. Hebrews 9 verse 27 makes it clear. It's appointed unto men once to die, and after this, the judgment. We should be concerned about when we die. We don't know how we're going to die, and we don't know when we're going to die. When I say when, I mean, how am I living? Well, if I'm living right day by day, what difference does it make uh, if I die that day? Or if I live to be tomorrow, if tomorrow comes, if I'm living as the Bible directs, then I'm prepared whenever it comes. So I have the responsibility to realize I should not let my heart, my heart what? My blood pump that's in my chest? No, he's talking about the inward man, the spirit that returns to God who gave it at the point of death. I have an obligation to exercise my mind, in effect, with the truth of God that I can study and know and live in harmony with it. Therefore, I don't let things bother me that bothers people who don't have salvation. Then he tells them that in my father's house are many mansions, which we talked about. Literally, he's saying there are many dwelling places, and I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I'll come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Then you'll remember that Jesus talked to Thomas. And we pointed out last week that Thomas says, uh, we don't know where you're going. Uh, how do we know the way? And Jesus then said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but by or through me. Then he says, if you had known me, you would have known my Father also. I spent some time on that last week emphasizing that Jesus 
the Holy Spirit, the Father, are one. We often say the first, second, third person of the Godhead. They are the one divine essence in three persons. Thus, to know Christ in the flesh was to know him in the sense that they saw his actions and they heard his teaching, not in the sense of his physical body, that was human, but in the sense of the spirit that was in him, which was divine. He was the second person of the Godhead. So, we too today can know Christ. How do we know him? Well, I don't know what he looked like. I don't know what his voice sounded like. But I know his will. I know how to be like him. I have his word. The gospel of Christ is God's power to save us, Romans 1.16. Again, that's one reason that Christ said it must be preached to every creature, Mark 16.15. So if we would know God the Father, then we must know Christ. To know Christ is to know his will. And I quote again, as I did last week, James 1, 25, whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. The only way to have Christ formed in us is for us to put into practice the will of Christ in our lives. Then Jesus talked to Philip, you'll remember. Philip said, uh, show us the Father, and it's enough for us, or it suffices us. And that's when he asked, have I been so long with you that you, you don't know me? And then we remarked again at that time about this business of how do we know Christ? Well, we know Christ through his word. Let me ask you this. If you say you know Christ, but you are ignorant of the truth of the gospel, the New Testament, how do you know him? That's the only way you can know him, is to know his will. Where is his will? It's in his word. And that's why Jesus would say, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judges him. The word that I have spoken the same shall judge him in the last day, John 12, 48. I don't have to wonder about the standard of judgment on the day of judgment. Jesus has already told me, and it's the New Testament. Everybody has access to one. And there's the standard whereby all men will be judged when this world is over. So Jesus continued to, to teach throughout this particular uh, chapter, and he said then, of course, that he was going to be sending the Holy Spirit. He said, the Holy Spirit will be sent to you in uh, my name, that is by my authority. And he'll teach you all three things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. Well, that is peculiarly stated to the apostles of Christ because he chose them to reveal the New Testament through. So when we come to the day the Lord's church was established in Acts chapter 2, the inspired Luke records that they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Well, why the apostles' doctrine? Because the apostles had been baptized in the Holy Spirit and had the Holy Spirit guiding them in what they said. Well, if we go on through this, we'll see as is introduced here in the last part of chapter 14, that it's the Holy Spirit who's revealing the mind of Christ to the apostles. Thus, through the miraculous element of the apostles and those they laid hands on and, and conveyed a miraculous gift to them, such as Timothy or, uh, Paul, or Luke or James, someone like that who was not an apostle, it was by the prophetic gift through the laying on of hands that they wrote the New Testament. Thus, when we speak of the New Testament, in fact, the whole Bible being inspired of God, it's not like Shakespeare or Milton or some great writer and through his genius and learning writing far better than anybody else. The word inspiration is used that way, but that's not the way it's used in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, where Paul said all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, 
that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. As has been pointed out lately several times by different speakers, that word, English word, inspiration, comes from a Greek word, theothenustos, and it means literally God breathed out his will to man. And thus he guided men like Paul and others, James or Mark, to write not of their own will and their own volition, but as Peter said, they were born along, directed by the Holy Spirit. So they're infallible in their writing. And thus we can say God wrote the Bible. Yeah, but didn't Paul write this and Peter write that? Yes, their hand wrote it down as it were. But where did the information come from? And who infallibly guided them to set down what they received? And that's the Holy Spirit. Thus, the Bible is inspired of God. We say it's plenary and verbally inspired. What does that mean? It means all of it is inspired and every word is inspired in the original languages, which is mostly Old Testament and Hebrew and New Testament and Greek. So they're being told here, I'm leaving, Jesus says. I'm not going to be among you anymore as I have been. I'm going to, there's going to be another comforter. We spent some time on the Greek word parakletos last week, and we transliterated it in English, and we simply said the paraclete. Well, there's no one word in the English language that defines or explains or translates the Greek word parakletos. It says comforter in your Bibles. Well, the best way I can describe to you the relationship invisibly that the Holy Spirit had with the apostles is the same relationship Jesus in the flesh had with them, except they could take Jesus, he's a human, and they could kill him, and they did. But then he prayed the Father that he would send them another comforter. Well, remember what we said last week? Another means had one first. You can't have another unless you had one before that. Well, Jesus says, I'll pray the Father, and he will send you another comforter. And he would be with you forever. What does that mean? As long as you need him, he's going to be with you. And thus they, to do the work Jesus called them to do, not only were witnesses as human beings, but also they had the Holy Spirit with them, even as Christ had been with them, but invisibly, to enable them to work miracles, to prove that the word they spake was from heaven and not from men. And they could also speak the word of God infallibly. Jesus would make it very clear that when you stand before folks, and he would say you'll stand before kings and others, to make a defense of the gospel, and that basically had to do with preaching the truth that would save man. He said, don't be concerned about what you'll say. It'll be given to you in that self same hour what you'd say. Well, I can tell you that it would be wonderful to be able not to have to study and just know when you wanted to speak on the subject, God would directly put it in your head. But it doesn't work that way anymore. Paul, by the Spirit, told the young preacher Timothy in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Well, it's a strange thing if God was always going to put into your mind infallibly his will without you doing anything to learn it, that he would tell Timothy to study. No, that was a temporary time. And when the word of God was fully revealed, proven to be the word of God by the miracles, signs, and wonders done by the apostles, and it was completely written down, then those things ceased. And now you want to know what Paul would teach if he walked this earth today? I can read it to you from the Bible. Paul made it clear to the Ephesians that if you want to know my understanding of the thing, read what I wrote. And, of course, that's the reason a great many people don't understand the truth, even many in the church. As was said by the prophet Hosea, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Well, I don't know how to learn it any more than to spend my life studying it, learning how to study it, learning how to ascertain the authority of my Lord from it. And that takes time, and you build on it from day to day. So this is a point that needs to be kept in mind. So he's the way, the truth, and the life. 
He is the only way to the Father. He, in fact, in the flesh was the revelation of the Father to man. And he says, believe me for my very work's sake. That is the miracles he worked were designed to prove he was who he claimed to be. And then he makes that wonderful statement, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. We can say we have faith in God. We can say we love God all we want. But when we refuse to obey him, we don't. We can deceive ourselves into thinking that we love God. But when we don't do what he said, the way he said it, for the reason or reasons he said it, we don't. And yet we have the power to deceive ourselves. That certainly happened in the very beginning when Eve deceived herself and thought she was all right to go ahead and disobey God. And yet she'd believe Satan's lie. To be saved, one must believe the truth and obey it. Be lost, one believes a falsehood or a lie and obeys it. That's been the pattern ever since the devil got his way in the garden. Thus, sin is the transgression of God's law, 1 John 3 and verse 4. Now, when we come into chapter 15 of John, the Lord is stressing to his disciples the importance of their abiding, and I want to underscore that word abiding, abiding in him, verses 1 through 8 of chapter 15. Notice how he does this. He took that which they were very familiar with, that was a vineyard. Those people had vineyards all over the place, just like when he could talk about uh, the matter of sowing seed. They knew all about that. It wasn't hard for them to understand. So he said, I'm the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser, really is what he's saying. He's the one that takes care of the vine. But then notice what he says. Every branch in me that doesn't bear fruit he takes away and every branch that bears fruit he prunes it that it may bear more fruit now anybody that's ever dealt with fruit trees or for that matter even uh, pecan trees or whatever or certainly a, a grapevine knows that it does better when you can prune out the dead wood and it's interesting that the lord made that clear so the branch cannot bear fruit unless it abides in the vine. That doesn't seem to be a difficult thing to understand. You cut a branch off the vine, that branch is dead. So he says, I am the vine. Ye are the branches. He didn't say churches are the branches. He said, ye, persons, people, humans are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. Now watch what he says. For apart from me, ye can do nothing. So he's emphasizing you must abide in me. You have the obligation to abide in me. Just because you're presently in me doesn't mean it's always going to be that way. He says, if anybody does not abide in me, notice he says, he's thrown away as a branch. Well, that branch is going to dry up. And what happens to them? Well, they're gathered up, they're cast into the fire, and they're burned. And that's the simple teaching the Lord did on a very important matter. You must continue, as I said earlier, to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. And of course, Paul had said to the Ephesians in Ephesians 1, 3, that all spiritual blessings in heavenly places are in Christ. So if you abide in me, and then he says, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it shall be done for you. Well, of course, he's talking about the Christian in general, but especially does this have emphasis concerning the work of the apostles of Christ. That was a singular work. The apostles are going to do their work, and they're going to die as far as their human being is concerned. They're going, like anybody else, leave this world at death. But are the apostles still doing what they did when they were on the earth? They certainly are. The apostles' doctrine is still here. It's the New Testament of Jesus Christ. That's exactly how the New Testament got here as we studied earlier. 
Now he says, by bearing much fruit, my father's glorified. And thus you prove yourselves to be my true disciples. Remember, disciple is one who is a follower or a learner of. It comes from the idea of discipline. You follow a certain discipline. And that's why people are called disciples. But he's speaking specifically to the apostles. And that's the difference in apostles and disciples. All, all disciples are those who follow Christ. All apostles follow Christ, but all apostles are not just and only. Or all disciples aren't apostles. So the apostles had a certain work to do. They're even mentioned as being in the foundation of the church. Why? Because through them, the will of Christ is revealed and is called by James, the perfect meaning complete law of liberty. The Lord stressed to his disciples the importance of their loving one another, verses 9 through 17. He says, as the Father loved me, I have also loved you. Now, it's interesting to ask the question, how does the Father love us? How do I know how the first person of the Godhead loves me? Well, I just simply look at how Christ loved them. And you could see that wasn't always a type of love that condoned everything the apostles did. He could get after them pretty strongly at times. Love is not just some sort of sick, sentimental, mushy, subjective emotionalism that says yes to everything that comes down the line and is afraid to ever correct somebody. The Lord did a lot of correcting, and the Bible was put on this earth to correct man. So when you understand that the Lord loved us, as the Father loved him, and we're to abide in his love, then if we love God, we'll keep his commandments. But part of those commandments is to reprove, rebuke, and exhort in the preaching of the word with all longsuffering and doctrine. It doesn't let sin alone. God never intended for people to be in sin and then those who are supposedly righteous, which they wouldn't be, to condone that sin. And he says, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. In this way, your joy will be made full. We've commented on this other times before, and others have too. But the joy here is not like a bunch of cheerleaders out at a pep rally. Joy comes from knowing you're right with God. <clears throat> you could be persecuted and physically hurting but inwardly, because you're faithful to God and suffering as a Christian, you have joy. It's the peace that passes all understanding. Now, the world may know joy from the standpoint of I won a million dollars yesterday and I'm just happy as I can be. Well, that's not exactly the kind of joy that's being talked about. I think I mentioned last week that when the Ethiopian eunuch had heard Philip preach Christ to him, and he said, here's water. What doth hinder me from being baptized? And he said, if thou believest with all thy heart, thou mayest. And so Peter and, uh, or rather Philip and uh, the Ethiopian eunuch went down to the water. Philip baptized him. And it says of him, when he came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord called away Philip and the eunuch went on his way rejoicing. Well, he knew he was right with God. And the only way I know I can be right with God or anybody else can be is to know that they know that they know the Bible and that they're honest with themselves and the application of it and they're willing to do it. So he says, this is my commandment that you love one another just as I've loved you. You remember when Peter committed a fault, a trespass and uh, Paul had to withstand him to the face because Peter was to be blamed. Well, I don't believe Paul hated Peter for that. I think he loved him like the Lord loved him. Peter had the Lord correct him, and Paul corrected Peter. There's no indication that Peter thought Paul was all mean and hateful and ugly. He just was thankful somebody loved him enough to tell him the truth. And that takes a lot of love sometimes. To love a person enough to tell them the truth. He says, you're my friends 
if you do what I command you. Well, you remember when you go over to James chapter 2 and James is writing to Christians concerning their conduct in the church. And he calls Abraham the friend of God. Well, he uses Abraham's obedience to God in offering up Isaac as proof of the kind of faithfulness that we all ought to have characterizing us, an obedient faith. He says, I'm not going to call you servants, or in the actual Greek language, it's doulos or slaves. Uh, for a slave doesn't know what his master's doing. He said, I'm calling you friends for all things that I've heard from my father, I've made known to you. And I think that's important to understand for us today, removed 2,000 years from the time that our Lord originally said this. The word of God is still the perfect law of liberty, is still the seed of the kingdom, is still the sword of the spirit. And as Hebrews 4 verse 12 reads, now the word of God is quick and powerful. That means alive and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit and the joints and marrow and as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. That's why Paul said preach it. And thus, when we teach it, the same word that the Lord brought to the apostles, same word that came in this world in the first century, then we're showing forth the love of God. And there's no other way you can preach Christ and him crucified or preach the gospel, God's power to save, Romans 1, 16, if you don't preach the word. To preach the gospel is to preach the word. Just another way of saying the same thing. And he said to the apostles, I choose you and I have appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. Let me comment just a little more about the bearing of fruit. Sometimes people think that the only way fruit is born by a Christian is when they're converted somebody to Christ. Well, I admit that's bearing fruit. Certainly it is. But there's a lot more to it than that. Remember what we said uh, earlier for those who heard the devotional talk about those men who let Paul down in a basket to escape persecution in Damascus. Well, I think they had a very important part and they were bearing fruit and helping Paul get away. I don't know who in the world they were. And what do we know about the gospel preacher Ananias more than what said that he was the one the Lord selected to go and tell Saul of Tarsus what to do to be saved? We don't hear any more out of him than that. And yet, he must have gone on and hopefully continued faithful in the calling. So fruit can be benevolence. The Bible has much to say about that. There are some people that can do more than others. We sing the song about Dorcas. In the Bible we find Dorcas was very kind. She was full of good works for the poor. She was sick and then died and the widows all cried until Peter kneeled down on the floor. Tabitha, that was the other name, you know. Arise, Simon Peter then cried. They were happy, so happy, for she opened her eyes. Well, what is she known for? Nothing's mentioned about her teaching. She was known for a benevolent work in making things for the widows. So those are ways, different ways of bearing fruit and that your fruit should remain. This is a good point to keep in mind concerning the omniscience of God, how God is all-knowing. He's not going to forget any, any deed because he knows all that's the object of knowledge. He says, even the very hairs of your head are numbered and not a sparrow falls that he doesn't know. And that means for his children who are saved, he takes note of all the good things they do. And by good things, I mean those things taught in the New Testament that are incumbent upon Christians in being faithful to him. He said, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. John spends a lot of time on this in his letters, talking about that he will answer prayer. Specifically, this has application to the apostles and their work because of the miraculous measure that they had in receiving, first of all, the truth of Christ known as the New Testament, but then the miracles that they worked. They were able to ask in God's name and 
they would be able to have what any Christian would have in answer to prayer. But they also delivered the will of Christ that we have as the New Testament. And therefore, the Holy Spirit worked with them in that way that he didn't work with everybody and does not work today. I, if I want to know the will of God today, I must go to the Bible. I must write and divide the word of truth, and I must be willing to understand it and then apply it. He says this, I command you that you love one another. So we ought to be loving one another. We ought to be helping each other to know the truth. We ought to be helping one another to live in harmony with it. And we should desire that we have that kind of fellowship. That, of course, is another story in itself that he's speaking really of fellowship between faithful children of God. That word fellowship from the Greek word koinonia means a sharing, a working together. And I've used this example before, but it's like the old sailing ships where you had all the people on board from the captain, the first mate, the other officers, and right on down to the regular sailor. They all had a part in making that ship sail. And they had, therefore, a fellows on a ship. Well, we're in the ark of safety, which is the Lord's church. We have a work to do. Each work may be different from somebody else's, but if it's all in harmony with the word of the Lord, then we have that kind of fellowship with doing God's will. And in effect, fellowship with God. We're his children. We're in his family. We're members of the body of Christ. We're citizens of the kingdom of heaven. We all exist because of what God did for us through Christ that we never could do for ourselves. But we can hear and understand the truth. We can will, he made us free moral agents, to comply with his will. And thus, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him, Hebrews 5 and verse 9. Now, the Lord warns, this is a good place for us to stop for tonight. He warns us that as they would be the apostles of Christ, hated and persecuted. So remember, he was hated and persecuted too, verses 18 through 21. He says, the world hated me. You know it'll hate you. If you were of the world, the world would love you. But because you're not of the world, therefore the world hates you. He says, remember, as I told you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. They, meaning the world, do not know the one who sent me. So we come to that point, and it seems a good place to stop, that we emphasize that one must have a great deal of what we might call grit, stamina, to stick with the truth. Jesus would do it this way, warning people, take up your cross daily and follow me. One of the things that we have to emphasize to people who want to become Christians, are you willing to make the sacrifice? Sacrifice is giving up that which is very, very important to you. But if the Lord requires it, we're willing to give it up, or as the case may be, take it on that we might be faithful to him. So we thank you for being with us in this study. The Lord willing, we'll continue on with this chapter and move on in through our study of the book of John. Let's go to our Heavenly Father in prayer, please. Our Father in heaven, for this time together and studying thy word, we're thankful. We pray that thou wilt help us daily to study the scriptures, that with honest hearts we'll study them and learn how to rightly divide the word of truth and make the necessary applications to our lives. Help us to realize how brief and uncertain life in the flesh is, and that regardless of our age, it won't be long for all of us before we must step into a vast eternity. So let us live our lives here that we can hear thee say someday, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter ye into the joys of thy Lord. For we ask all these things in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen.